Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Islamic Audiobooks Collection. I will be reading When the Moon Split by Safir Rahman Mubarakburi, which we downloaded from galamullah.com. Let's read. Page 180. At that point, Abdullah bin Ubay, the head of the hypocrites, sent them a message urging them to stay on, for he had 2,000 warriors ready to enter their fortress and defend them. The hypocrites had once more struck to undermine the Prophet peace be upon him's position. Surah al-Hashr refers to the tenuous alliance and how it was patched together with lies. Did you not observe the hypocrites tell their faithless friends from among the people of the book? If you are driven out, we will accompany you. We will never obey your enemies, and if you are attacked, we will defend you. But Allah is a witness that they are liars. Quran 59 verse 11 The Jews felt emboldened at such shows of support from their purported friends. They sent a message to the Prophet peace be upon him that they were not about to leave Medina regardless of the consequences. The Prophet peace be upon him responded, Allahu Akbar, and his companions echoed the cry. It was a call to arms, entrusting the safety of Medina to Ibn Umm Maktoum, may Allah be pleased with him, and the Muslim standard to Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet and his troops advanced towards the territory of Banu Nadir and laid siege to them. The Jews took refuge in their fortresses and castles and showered arrows and stones at the Muslim army. Since their date groves and gardens stood as a buffer zone, the Prophet peace be upon him ordered his men to cut down the trees and set the gardens ablaze. This act sank the spirits of Banu Nadir. After six days of holding out, some say a fortnight, they agreed to lay down arms on condition that they would be allowed to go safely into exile. Their friends among Banu Quraida had failed to support them, as had the head of the hypocrites and his allies. Their allies deceived them, the way Satan does when he says to a man, Disbelieve in Allah. When the man listens to him and commits disbelief, Satan suddenly says, I am not responsible for your decision. I fear Allah, the Lord of the universe. Quran 59 verse 16 The Prophet, peace be upon him, allowed the Jews to take all their belongings except their arms. They carried with them whatever they could, even the doors, windows and beams of their houses. The Quran refers to this event in the following verse. Allah drove out the faithless tribe of Jews from their homes at the first gathering. You did not think that they would leave, and they thought their fortresses would protect them from Allah. But Allah approached them in a way they did not expect and cast terror in their hearts. Their homes were destroyed by their own hands as well as by the believers. Reflect on this event, those of you who have eyes. Quran 59 verse 2 Thus, the Jews left Medina, most of them settling in Khaybar, while a small group migrated to Syria. The land confiscated from the Jews was divided among the first Makkan emigrants, while Abu Dujana and Sal bin Hanif, two members of the Ansar, were given plots because of their financial situation. The Prophet, peace be upon him, used part of the revenue from the land to maintain his wives for the whole year. The rest he spent on defence and for providing horses and arms for the Muslim warriors. Fifty coats of mail, fifty helmets and three hundred swords that had been seized were also distributed among the Muslim troops. Abu Sufyan had left Uhud with the promise of another military encounter the following year, and with the arrival of Shaban for a H, the Prophet peace be upon him, preempted his adversary in a march toward the battlefield. He camped at Badr, where he waited eight days for Abu Sufyan. He had with him a force consisting of 1,500 soldiers and 10 horses. Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, was the standard bearer, while the administration of Medina was handed over to Abdullah bin Rahawa, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Sufyan 
also set out with an army of 2,000 soldiers, including 50 cavalrymen. But from the start, he appeared to be lacking fire. Upon arriving at the venue, he remarked to his men, Battle is suitable when there is freshness and greenery throughout, so that animals can graze and we can also drink milk. But now, as there is drought everywhere, I am going back. You people should follow me. Abu Sufyan's entire army seemed to share his sentiments and tamely marched back without meeting the enemy. The Muslims, meanwhile, stayed on in Badr and carried out a number of business transactions. They sold their goods and made handsome profits. The Quraysh had retreated without drawing a single sword. So, the Muslims returned with their military reputation in high standing. In Rabil Awal, that same year, the Prophet, peace be upon him, launched a punitive attack on a group of bandits at Dumat al Jandal. At last, all the enemies were subdued and there was peace for an entire year, a year that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was able to spend consolidating the faith and teaching his followers. The Battle of the Trench After the expedition against the Banu Nadir and the meek departure of the Quraysh from Badr, a year and a half went by without any disturbances. It seemed that the Muslims were finally free to spread their religion and bring about changes in their environment and daily lives. But the ideal was soon to be disrupted. The exiled Jewish tribes had consolidated their base at Khaybar, and having done so, they began to dream of vengeance. Realising the need to rally as much manpower as possible, they went about seeking allies against the Muslims. Some biographers say that 20 chieftains and leaders of the Khaybar Jews went to the Quraysh, pledging support for a renewed military campaign. When the Quraysh agreed, the Jewish delegation contacted Banu Ghatfan and they also gave their consent. More and more clans were roped in and the plan was that each of them should move towards Medina simultaneously. When the news of the coalition reached Medina, the Prophet, peace be upon him, conferred with his companions as to strategy. The Muslims, being so heavily outnumbered, it was imperative that they come up with an impenetrable defence. Salman al-Farsi advised that the Muslims should dig a trench to keep the enemy away, and everyone approved of the suggestion. Medina was naturally fortified on three fronts, with volcanic plains and granite hills to the east, west and south. The city was exposed only on the north, from where the enemy forces could launch an assault. Therefore, the Prophet, peace be upon him, chose to fortify that front. He marked the narrowest spot, stretching between the east and west, and covering a distance of about one mile. Both belts were connected at this spot by the trench. In the west, the trench began from the north of the Salah hills and joined the end of the easterly belt at Sheikhain. The Prophet, peace be upon him, divided his men into units of ten, with each unit responsible for digging forty cubits. He himself participated in the task of digging the trench and carrying loads of earth. It was a massive undertaking and the Muslims worked steadily. Their morale soared as they relied on their faith in Allah and their devotion to his Prophet, peace be upon him, for moral sustenance. The companions sang praises of Allah and the Prophet, peace be upon him, joined in. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, sang, the companions responded. They bore with quiet heroism the rigorous hardships before them, particularly the biting cold and gnawing hunger. A handful of barley was procured and cooked in rancid, foul-smelling fat. Swallowing the food was a challenge in itself. Once the men went to the Prophet, peace be upon him, complaining of debilitating hunger. As proof, each showed him a slab of stone tied to his belly to stave off the hunger pangs. The Prophet, peace be upon him, lifted his shirt. Tied to his abdomen were two slabs of stone. The pagans 
had clamoured for miracles to confirm the divine nature of the Prophet, peace be upon him's message. Allah had sent them signs that they ignored. During the excavation of the trench, Allah sent the Muslims several signs of his grace, signs that increased their faith and sustained them through adversity. On one occasion, Jabir bin Abdullah could not bear to see the Prophet, peace be upon him, assailed by severe hunger. He slaughtered an ewe and his wife ground about two and a half kilograms of barley. He then went to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and discreetly invited him and a few of the Prophet, peace be upon him's companions. The Prophet, peace be upon him, accepted the invitation, but brought everyone along, all one thousand of them. Everyone ate until he was full, but the pot remained replete and the bread continued to bake unchecked. Similarly, once the sister of Numan bin Bashir took a handful of dates for her father and maternal uncle, the Prophet peace be upon him took the dates and scattered them on a cloth. He then called all the men as they worked away at the trench. Each of them ate to his full and left, but the dates kept multiplying and could barely be contained within the cloth. The soil the men encountered was rocky and obdurate. Jabir and his group struck a particularly rocky patch that failed all their efforts. The problem was brought to the notice of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and as he struck it with his pick, it crumbled into a mound of pliant sand. Other obstacles became oracles with Allah's grace. Bara and his unit came across a large rock. The Prophet, peace be upon him, knelt and said, Bismillah, before he used his pick. A piece of the rock came loose with a light emerging from it. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allahu Akbar, the keys of Syria have been given to me, and right now I see its red castle. The Prophet, peace be upon him, then struck a second blow with his pick and received tidings of the imminent victory over Persia. The last blow signified the conquest of Yemen. In this way, the entire rock was demolished, with each blow bringing the Muslims hope. While the Muslims concentrated on defence, the Quraysh and their followers arrived with an army of 4,000 men, 300 horses and a 1,000 camels. Abu Sufyan rode proudly as the commander-in-chief of the Allied forces and their standard-bearer was Uthman bin Talha Adari. They camped at a spot between Jarf and Zaghaba, opening another front, Banu Gatfan and their 6,000 followers, the men of Najd, pitched camp at the end of Naqmi Valley in the foothills of Mount Uhud. The arrival of two large armies so close to the walls of Medina posed an enormous threat to the Muslims. Allah mentions the Mammoth Military Coalition in Surah al adab Behold, they marched upon you from above and below, and then your eyes spun around and your hearts leapt to your throats. You began to doubt Allah's plan, yet in this was a trial for the believers and an immense jolt. Quran 33 verse 10 to 11 But Allah Almighty kept the believers firm on that occasion. He says, when the believers saw the confederate forces, they said, This is what Allah and his messenger promised us, and Allah and his messenger have told us the truth. And it only increased their faith and their submission to Allah. Quran 33 verse 22 However, the hypocrites among the Muslims were fearful and querulous. They said, Allah and his messenger have promised us nothing but delusions. Quran 33 verse 12 Once again, the Prophet peace be upon him appointed Ibn Umm Maktoum caretaker of Medina and sent the women and children to take shelter in forts. He then set out with 3,000 men and fortified his troops, keeping their backs to Mount Salah. In front was the trench that stood between the Muslims and unbelievers. 
جزاک اللہ خیر فلسنگ